For those of you that are visiting today or are new to our fellowship, um, you're probably wondering, orange? It is not a Bronco thing. Okay, let me just assure you that Orange Crush is in Denver. Okay, or in your home. Um, and, and that's hard to say because I grew up in Denver. Um, this is why we're wearing orange. To remember our brothers and sisters that in so much of the world are being persecuted for his name's sake. Because they refuse to deny him. They refuse to say, I will reject my God. I will accept Jesus. <clears throat> they refuse to live a lie. I, I read many stories. I, I get three or four different uh, emailings a week. I get several in the snail mail. And I'm amazed constantly at what these people have to face and the grace that God gives them to face it. Um, these men in the picture up here, uh, there were actually uh, two brothers in this group. And they were from Syria. And one of their brothers and their mother um, were being talked to about this this murder, this persecution, this martyrdom. And they said, we thank God that these terrorists left the audio on because as the mother was watching two of her sons die, she heard them calling out to Jesus and giving praise to him. And she said, if I heard this, knowing what it means, how many people heard it not knowing what it means, and how much of God's Spirit is going out through that call? And she said, I see these people in the street outside my apartment every day. And she said, a lot of people don't understand. They, they would think that I would look at them with hostility and hatred and anger. But she said, I, I love them. And that's something only God could do. I love them and I hurt for them because they're so lost. And I read over and over again about these stories of, of people that are suffering persecution. A pastor in China, he's been arrested no less than 22 times. For 60 days, he was chained hand, hands to feet. And that he was day and night, 24 hours a day. His hands were chained to his feet. He had to feed himself and take care of himself in that position. They have a law that they can hold anyone for up to, it's like 14 or 16 days with no charges. And there for several years, he would go to church and preach on Sunday and come out of church and go to jail. And they'd hold him for two weeks. And after the two weeks was done, he'd go back to preaching. And they'd go back to arresting. And he'd go back to jail. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, Richard Wormbrand. He's the founder of Voice of the Martyrs. He suffered in a communist prison for a number of years. And he tells a story. He, he tells it in the third person. But we believe it was actually him. He's in prison and he's preaching to the other prisoners. He's sharing the gospel. And the prison guards come in and, and they start yelling at him. You have to stop this. This is why you're here in the first place. We didn't bring you here to preach. And they drag him out and they took him to a room and they, they beat him. And they brought him in, and, and he couldn't even stand. They threw him on the floor, and he was bleeding. And all of these men are around, and he looked up, and he said, Now, where was I? And he went back to preaching. <clears throat> so today, orange, we wear orange as a visual reminder of those all around the world that are suffering. This is not something that's just taking place in the Far East or in the Middle East. It's all over the world. It's in Central and South America. There are places in the United States that we see it happening. We see a murder uh, a few, uh, five, six weeks ago where the, the person asked them, are, are you a believer? And if they're a believer, they got shot in the head. If they weren't, they got shot in the leg. It, it happens. So we're going to show a, a brief video. Um, go ahead and, and bring that up. We'll watch that, and then we'll get back to where we are now.
We need to, we, we have a lot of obstacles that we have to overcome. In order to be Christ-like, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Christ bids a man come, he bids him come and die. You can't take any of yourself away from the cross. It's got to it's be put up on the cross, it's got to stay there. Matthew tells us that we have to take up our cross and follow him. Luke tells us take up our cross and follow him daily. It's an ongoing thing. We don't have the misconceived luxury of walking away from it. When, when you come to Christ, According to the world's eyes, you come with everything and you walk away with nothing. Because you give everything to him. But the economy of God is so radically different than what we understand, what we perceive, what we comprehend. Because God says when you come to him, you're bringing nothing. You have nothing of value to offer him. You're like the prodigal son that squandered all of his wealth. And when he came back, he came back with pig scum, filth. He had nothing to offer his father. But when he came, his father ran to meet him, cleaned him up, clothed him, prepared a feast. See, in God's economy, you bring nothing to the cross, but you gain everything. Everything. Jesus tells us that, you know, anything that you've given up in this life, you've given up mother, father, husband, wife, children, property, anything that you give up, you will be repaid a hundredfold, both in this life and in the life to come. I am absolutely convinced that mankind has a vision problem. We can't see. <clears throat> We're so narrow focused and short, so short sighted that we can't see truth. We look around and say, this is reality. Let, let's talk about reality for a minute. When Jesus spoke on the mountain, after he was done, he came down and he said, we need to feed these people. <laughs> feed them? We don't have that much. We don't have the food or the money. Well, how can we feed them? The reality was they had a couple fish and a couple loaves of bread. That's reality. Come on, Jesus, wake up. See, that's what we see. We see the can't. God sees the can't. We see the lack. God sees the abundance. What did Jesus do with the fish and the loaves? Taking them, he broke them and thanked God. Not only was everybody fed, but they had 12 basketfuls left over. We can't do that. We don't have that ability. We can't take a few fish and loaves and feed 5,000 plus and have leftovers. A couple of fish and loaves would not feed my family and have anything left. We are limited by what we perceive as reality.
When we were in Israel, we heard several times, and, and I believe this to be true, what we see in the physical is merely the outcome of the spiritual. Okay? Reality is played on a spiritual level, and then the outcome is what we see. And this is why prayer is so vital, so critical. We cannot function without an ongoing communication, an ongoing intimacy with God. You know, you pray over your meals, great. We have taken prayer and we've either ritualized it to the point that we have no idea what we're praying or we've reduced it to presenting our want list to a deified Santa Claus. Give me, give me, give me. Bless me, bless me, bless me. And those of us that may even have some maturity might even pray to bless others. Oh, and if you have enough left over after you give me Bless them. <clears throat> when Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, such a small portion was given to self. Such a small portion was given to self. Part of our vision problem, especially here in the West, we don't understand the call. If you have your Bibles, open to John chapter 15. That, that we have a really radically misunderstanding about is when Jesus went into Jerusalem, he didn't just go with him and the twelve. Do you understand that? That he had hundreds of disciples, but he only had twelve apostles. Okay? We know that when he went into Jerusalem, there were at least the twelve, and then there were those that looked after their deeds. We, we read later at the crucifixion, there were women, there were at least four or five women that were there to look after his needs. When they gathered together in the upper room, there were at least 120 that gathered together with them. Okay? So we know there were more that were with them. So when he's speaking, don't just read this as though he's speaking to the 12. Okay? Because God, in his infinite wisdom, is speaking down through the centuries to us. Verse 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Keep your finger there. We're going to jump over to uh, 2 Timothy. We're going to come back to John, so, so keep, a, keep a note there. So we're in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, before I read this, I don't ever like to read anything out of context. So, so let's kind of set the stage here. Paul is writing a letter. This is his second letter to Timothy. And he calls him, my beloved son in the faith. Okay? 
This is one of Paul's adoptees. He has a number of them, and, and as you read through Paul's epistles, he, he points out those that were close to his heart. We know Timothy was one. We know Titus was one. There are several others that he names. But he's writing to Timothy, and he's at the end of his life. This is one of the last epistles that we have with Paul's. He knows the end is coming, and he's trying to pour everything that he has left into Timothy that Timothy can carry on the work. Okay? And so he's telling him, you, speaking to Timothy, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. It started in verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10. My persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So now, now listen to Paul's heart as he's pouring out to Timothy. Timothy, you've seen all that I've faced. He, he's listing out these, these cities that he listed out. We, we read about them in Acts 13 and 14. This is Paul's first missionary journey, and he goes to Antioch, and, and at first the Jews receive him. They, they go to the synagogue, him and Barnabas, and they receive him with joy, and they're excited. But then the next week when they're invited back, all the city comes. And the Jews go, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys don't come when it's just us. And they, they are ignited in jealousy. And they start to withstand and rebuke and, and openly argue with Paul and, and Barnabas what they had received the week before. As a matter of fact, at Iconium, they drug Paul out of the city and stoned him and left him for dead. Now that's persecution. And Paul, my personal belief, is when Paul is talking about the man going to heaven and the thorn in his flesh that God had given him, I believe that's when Paul went to heaven. I believe in that instant he was dead. And he went to heaven and God revealed him to him things that he was not allowed to share. And then said, your work's not done. Get down, go to work. And so Paul gets up and goes back into the city. Okay? And he tells him, you know all of these persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Now here's the key to this verse. Indeed, all who live, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus might suffer hardship, could possibly have bad things said about them, You know, the, the higher muckety-mucks might even face some kind of persecution, depending on which country you go to. No, that's not what he says. Paul does not equivocate here. Okay? Paul says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, we in the Western world, we really don't understand this. We don't understand will be persecuted because for so long we've been so sheltered. I have seen so many writings and explanations that talk about this and they, they want to change the context of this to being in a sinful world. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the case. We all suffer because of a sinful world. We all have things that come on us because the, the world itself has not yet been redeemed. We, we struggle with 
disease and hardship. But the context in which this is being used is always in service to God. Not just generally in the life as applies to everyone. It's always speaking to those who choose willingly to lay down their lives and take up his. See, the, the, the choice we have in this life is, is very simple. You get to choose which master you will serve. That's it. Okay? See, that's, that's really the core of the gospel right there. Is everybody serves a master. Some thinks it might be themselves. Ah, oh man, I'm serving me. I'm out for numero uno. Who are they really serving? They're serving the God of this world, Satan. Because, see, he doesn't care what you think as long as you are not serving God. He'll let you think whatever you want. He'll let you serve yourself, your country, your money. He doesn't care. Because he knows in the end, as long as you are not serving God, he's got you. The choice that you have then is will you continue serving the false gods, whatever that is in your life, or will you serve the one true God? See, that's the whole point of the cross that we would come to know Him. That we would be restored to a right relationship with Him. Well, this is the International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. Why are you going on this? Because see, this is where it starts. This is where all of this begins. When you come to the cross, you forsake your old allegiances and you commit yourself to new. The old allegiances do not like it. And they will do everything they can to cause you to stumble in your new. Now, the God of this world knows what's going on in some parts, far better than we do. Okay? And the people that are serving him, now you think about those that are persecuting Christians, you realize that between 70 and 80% of all persecution going on for religious reasons is against Christians. Do you understand that? 70 to 80% worldwide, the persecution that people are being persecuted for religious reasons is against the Christian church. Okay? Now, we don't see this in America. We have a vision problem. It's much more comfortable to turn the channel and raise the volume. It's much more comfortable to close the book and pick up the paper. It's more convenient. It's more easy. See, to find out about the persecution of the church, you got to look. You got to dig. You got to work. Because, see, the, the media doesn't want to talk about it. I mean, you, you see things like the, the guys in the, the orange jumpsuits, okay? That, that was a. But you, you, that stuff is happening all the time. That stuff is happening all the time. There's a pastor in Iran that shared that uh, he was able to baptize 14 new believers in Iran. Within two months, 12 of them were dead. The 13th was in prison. Now, you can profess to be a Christian, and in a lot of places, they'll pretty much turn their nose up at you. They'll ignore you. But when you are baptized, when you openly declare 
that you have turned your back on everything else. You have openly declared war on them. And that's how they see it. See, it's not just the Muslims. There's persecution with the Buddhists and the Hindi. There's persecution with the... Um, the false gods in, in South and Central America that want to restore their worship to what it was way back when human sacrifice was the norm. But it's not just religious reasons. Christians are also being persecuted for political reasons. Why in the world does communism find Christianity such a threat? And yet, for decades, communist countries have imprisoned and tortured hundreds, thousands of believers because of their faith. Because of their faith. They want to break them. They send them to re-education camps. Look, we've been to the best re-education camp there is. We've been to the cross, and that changed everything about me. It opened my eyes to things that without Christ, without His Holy Spirit living in me, I would never be able to comprehend. And that's part of the problem. As a matter of fact, Jesus said when they persecute you, they'll think they're doing a good thing. As a matter of fact, some of them will think they're doing God a favor by making you suffer. I love what the Jews call us. The Jews call us the Nozim. They, they take it off of a Nazarene because Christianity, Christianity was the Jews completed. The, the Jews that were waiting for their Messiah received him and they were called the Nazarenes. And then God took the word and he spread it out. He shot it out from Jerusalem. And, and it impacted the Gentile world. And, and we talked about, a bit about that last week and how that thing is coming full circle. In Antioch, the, Christ, the, the, the Nazarenes were first called Christians. It was a term of insult. They were mocking them. Oh, you guys are just like Jesus. You're little Jesuses. And they went, yeah, perfect. That describes us perfectly. Christians, we're Christians. Did you put up the... Symbol, please. Mary Lou has given me a, a, I don't even know what these things are called, a rubber bracelet. <laughs> it is a reminder. On it, it has the symbol. That'll be up there in a minute. <laughs> This symbol is an Arabic letter, okay? You'll see it up on the front. It's the Arabic letter for N, N, okay? ISIS was using this to mark Christian homes. See it? They were going to all of the homes and they would mark them with an N for Nazarene. And they would tell the people that lived there, you got X amount of days to get out, convert, or pay a fee for us to let you stay here. Which very quickly became get out, convert, or die. And the Christians often gave up everything and, and they packed what they could. They took their wives and their children and boom, they left. We have one of the largest exoduses of Christians in recorded history going on in the Middle East right now. Hundreds of thousands of Christians have been uprooted. Their homes have been taken away. Thousands of them have been murdered. See, if you dare to open the book, you dare to look, you dare to, to take a peek at what's going on in the world to the body of Christ, 
You see things that will break your heart. And some of the stories are horrific. Horrific. The things that the enemy will do to break the followers of Christ is despicable. Mm -hmm. Disgusting. And I'm not going to glorify what they do even by talking about it in detail. But know this. So you go back to John where we were just a minute ago. Okay? We're actually going to go to John 16. One chapter over. Still, all part of the same discussion, the same dialogue that Jesus is having with the apostles and the disciples. Okay, so we've got some stuff that comes in. Jesus is warning them about what's coming. I would challenge you to read this entire passage, not not chapter verse. Read where Jesus starts talking to the disciples, and go all the way through to its finish. Ignore the numbers. Read it the way it was written. Okay, so. Coming down, Jesus has already told them um, they're going to suffer hardship. Starting down in uh, verse 32. So we're in 1632. Jesus says, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Okay, so he's warning them, hey, time's here. All this thing that I've been talking about for three and a half years, everything I've been focusing on for the last six months, it's here, it's now. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart I have overcome the world. Okay? Now see, as a Christian, we are called to a life that is going to be earmarked by persecution. Do you, do you want to know why I honestly believe so few Christians in America suffer any kind of persecution from the light things like being mocked or, or even, even cursed? to being spit upon or struck. You know why I believe in America Christians are saved from this? I don't think it's because America is a Christian nation. I think it's because Christians are apathetic. See, we don't mind talking about God here. We've come into the safety of the sanctuary where we know there are people of like mind. We may have some differences in the specifics, but generally we all agree. Right? Okay? Because if you don't generally agree, you don't come back. That's how easy it is. As a matter of fact, sometimes in the specifics, if you don't agree, you don't come back. You go to another church that agrees with you on that specific. Okay? We, we become apathetic. We've watered down the word to such a degree that when we give them the living waters... It's tepid and without light. Now, I got to tell you, one of the first things I did when we got back from Israel, when I got home, is I went and I filled up my water bottle and drank it. Because we have some of the best water, at least between America and Israel. Because in Israel, there is no cold water. They run their water lines, they lay them on top of the ground, and you're driving down the road, and there's water lines. Oh, that would explain why when I took my shower and drank my water, the water was the same temperature. Okay? The water there was tepid. It was, it was just the ambient room temperature, and you filled it up, and you, it was wet, but it was not refreshing in any way. And see, that's the water that we are trying to pour out to this world around us that has become so indoctrinated with the Christian culture, the American Christian culture, 
where we have tried to fuse together American idealism with Christianity that 80 to 90 percent of Americans declare themselves to be Christian. And that only about 24 percent of them are in church this morning. We're not persecuted because we're not a threat. We don't suffer hardship from the world because we have been lulled into a sense of complacency. We rejoice, we sing, we praise here, we pray here. And then we go out in the world and the world has no clue what has gone on in here because we don't take it out with us. We take our light and we hide it. And, and you've played this game. I, I've played this game. You kind of dance around with a person to check out, are they a Christian? You know, you do the, the Christian two-step. <laughs> <laughs> ah! I found a dance partner! Are you a believer? Yeah, isn't it great? And we secret ourselves and we talk about these things and hope that somebody might have good enough ears or turn their hearing aid just enough up to hear what we're talking about so they'll be saved too. But we don't dare turn around and embrace them. See, as a follower of Christ, you're called to the cross. You're called to a place where the world will hate you. But if they never know where your allegiance lies, they don't care. As a matter of fact, a lot of them probably think your allegiance still lies with them. James writes, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity toward God? Look, we, we have to speak the truth in love. Okay? We speak the truth in love. Now, the Christian world has been really good at doing one or the other of those things, but not very good at doing both. We like to speak the truth, and we condemn everybody to hell, and we're just like the Pharisees. We go out and make them aware of their sin, but then we don't do anything to get them out of that predicament. Or, or we put such carefully measured positions on it that in order to be saved, you've got to be like me. Well, that's, that's not what Scripture says. We, we put these strictures and these rules and regulations, you know, hey, you've got you to gotta get rid of your drinking, get rid of your smoking, get rid of your partying, you've got to watch Fox and not CNN. And we put these strictures on them and say, aha! Now you're living the life. And God will tell them on that day, I don't know who you are. Box? <laughs> that didn't have my stamp of approval. Neither does CNN or CNBC or any of them. They all are caught up in their own view of things. We've got just a few minutes here. This is the International Day of Prayer. So normally at this point, I would ask for your prayer requests. I'm not going to ask for your prayer requests at this point. If you have something that is critical, please take the card in front of you, write down on the back, put it in the box up front, okay? So we can be praying for you throughout the week, okay? Because we do want to pray with you. But today we're going to take the time and we are going to pray for the persecuted church. We're going to, we're going to pray three things, okay? The first thing is those who are suffering for his name's sake. Okay? that are refusing to recant, they are refusing to deny him, we're going to pray that God will strengthen them, that God will use them as a living and even dying testimony unto himself. Okay, So we're going to pray for the persecuted church, but we're also going to pray for the persecutors. Because when Christ went to the cross and he looked down through eternity, he saw their need of his sacrifice. <clears throat> he looked down and he saw how desperate some of these mass murderers were. And he said, yeah, I, I will pay the price. I will pay the price for them. So we're going to pray for the persecuted church. We're going to pray for the persecutors. 
And we're also going to pray for the apathetic church. Okay. We're going to pray for those who have locked up our ears and blinded our eyes so that we won't see what is going on. See, Scripture tells us that when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. <laughs> okay? It also says when one part of the body rejoices, the whole body rejoices. So, so we're going to be praying for the persecuted church, for the persecutors, and for us. Okay? So if you would, bow your heads. And I'm, I'm actually going to pause a little bit after each section where I pray. And if anybody has a, a, a prayer that they would like to pray at that time, we'll pray for the persecuted church first. I'll give you some time to pray. We'll pray for the persecutors. I'll give you some time to pray. We'll pray for, for us. And I'll give you some time to pray. And then we'll, we'll wrap up and we'll close. Father, we come before you right now interceding on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Names that we've heard, faces that we've seen, people that we may not even know, so many of them, Father, that have not been brought to our awareness. Father, we thank you for the testimony that they are living out right now Father, even the testimony that they are dying for. That at some point in their life, they had an encounter with the Almighty God. They cried out in repentance, received the blood of the Lamb, and were made new creations. The old was dead, buried. The new resurrected to new life, being sealed with your Holy Spirit, and in them you have made your dwelling. Father, we ask that you would strengthen them right now. God, that you would ease their suffering right now. Father, that you would surround completely the families that are broken apart as moms or dads or both are imprisoned. For those families who have had loved ones taken from them because of this faith, God, we are asking for your peace. God, that as they call out to you, you would answer as you have promised repeatedly in your word you would answer. Father, I am asking that their testimony would go forth purely. That through your power, blind eyes would be opened. So we lift up the persecuted church, your body,
Father, we pray for those who are persecuting your body, who have raised their hand against you, who have clenched their fists, who are grinding their teeth at you, who are calling down curses on your people. Father, you love them, even as you loved us before we came to you. You love them with a steadfast love. And Father, you have opened the door, you have made a way, you have paid the price that they can be redeemed. So Father, we lift up those that are persecuting your church. We ask God that the testimonies of those that they are abusing and even murdering, Father, would pierce the veil that your spirit would call them, even as so many times we read about it being done, even as with Paul, he would give them a Damascus Road experience. God, that you would claim them for your very own. Open their eyes, Father. Unstop their ears. Break the hearts of stone. Redeem them, Father. <clears throat> Father, I ask that whatever suffering you allow from your people would glorify you to such an extent that those that are persecuting them couldn't help but see the truth of Jesus and his power and his, and his godhood. I just ask, God, that you would just bring glory to your name through this God and that, that you wouldn't let anyone suffer in vain but that, that those that see their suffering would see your glory and would um, as Glenn prayed, would soften their hearts to you and you would break through the veil and they would humble themselves before you and receive your salvation Father, we repent for not paying attention, for choosing to look the other way, for so easily neglecting those parts of the body that are suffering. We ask God that you would bring an awareness to those of us who are not facing persecution, who are not suffering for your name's sake, that, Father, we would pray, we would intercede, we would do those things that we could do to ease the suffering of our brothers and sisters. Father, that we would even visit those in prison and minister to those who are sick. Father, open our eyes to what we can do. I ask, Father, that you would give us the courage that you have given them that we would look those who scorn us in the eyes and we would confess the love that you have for them. I ask, Father, that you would give us that love, that we would love them as you love them. I ask, Father, that you would shake us up, make our lazy boys uncomfortable to sit in, but comfortable to pray in. Help us, Father, to look into your word, to set aside our preconceived ideas of how things must be, and to look into the word and see the truth. Father, to let it saturate our minds and our hearts. Father, let it come out of our mouths as we speak. Open our eyes, Father. Father, as the song 
Thomas said, um, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, renew of thy spirit within me. Father, I just pray that that would come and happen to us here, in the church here in America, God. Um, like Glenn said, we become so apathetic and lazy. I just pray, God, that the joy of your salvation would just come to us in such a way that we would bubble over and everyone else would see it. And uh, that it would, even if it leads to persecution or being shunned by people, God, that it would be a joy to us. Thank you, Father, that as Jesus spoke to the disciples, and even as we read in your word, you wrapped it up by saying, Take heart, for I have overcome the world. Even in the midst of all of Paul's suffering, the persecution, he could still say, The Lord has delivered me from them all. We bless you today, Father, and I ask that you would make of this fellowship a bright, bright light. That from here, your, your waters, your living waters would flow forth. Father, that we would go into the dark places to bring your light. Help us all to be aware that there is so much more to what you've called us to than we now see. And we bless you, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.